morning. We are uh, very thankful for all those who are visiting here with us. Um, I hope that uh, obviously many of you who are visiting came to the Ladies' Day and participated in teaching in the Ladies' Day. And I hope that was very fruitful for you. I know it was good for the uh, women here. I know uh, Hannah enjoyed herself, and so thank you for those who prepared your time and your lessons uh, for the benefit of others. I appreciate that. This uh, morning, we're continuing with a uh, series of lessons that we began last Sunday that were, for lack of a better word, inspired by what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7 and verses 21 through 23. There in Matthew chapter 7, 21 through 23, as Jesus is coming down to a conclusion in his Sermon on the Mount, he tells his disciples that not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will inherit the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And then he shares with us a sorrowful reality where he says, On that day many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. It is certainly a sad thought to consider that there are going to be so many who at some point, to some degree within their life, have lived in service to Jesus Christ, but yet are going to be rejected by him. And they're not going to be rejected by him as we you know, gave some thought to last Sunday because of the fact that he's unjust and that he forgets people. He knows who are his. He knows the way the righteous, Psalm 1 and verse 6, uh, 2 Timothy 2 and verse 19. The Lord knows those who are his. And so the reality is, to one extent or another, those who are going to receive these words have forgotten him. And the challenge that... I think this text presents, or the caution that this text warrants, is that we are going to stand before Jesus Christ, our judge. Following the lesson we're going to sing, someday you will stand at the bar on high. What will your answer be? What is going to be our defense? What is going to be the sentence that we receive? We talked about that a little bit in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 5 in Bible class. What are we going to hear from him? We're either going to hear one of two things. Well done, good and faithful servant, or depart from me, you worker of lawlessness. And so how do we make it to where we only hear, because we're only going to hear one of those things, we only hear well done, good and faithful servant. And here's a question. How do I make sure I'm not a Matthew 7, 21 through 23 <laughs> Christian? That's, a, that's the question we're asking. That's the question we began with last Sunday. We're continuing with this Sunday. And I believe the answer is found in the Sermon on the Mount. And so last Sunday, we looked at Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16, where Jesus is going to give the Beatitudes, and then he's also going to supply two different images for the Christian. And whenever we look at those texts, we see in Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 through 5, the first three Beatitudes, that you and I, we must be holy, or rather, we must be humble. In verses 6 through 9, we see that we must be holy. Verses 10 through 12, we must be heroic. In verses 13 through 16, we must be helpful. Matthew uh, chapter 5, 3 through 16, the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, is addressing what we must be as his disciples. Now, between that and the section which we're going to address uh, today, looking at the largest section in the whole Sermon on the Mount, which is verses 21 through 48. We're splitting that up, so no need to be too concerned. Uh, although I would understand some concern because we're going to look at 21 through 37. At least that's the goal this morning, 21 through 37. Now, <clears throat> as Jesus arrives to this section, he said some very important things in verses 17 through 20 that we just want to take a brief second to look at here. In verse 17, he reminded them, his disciples, of his purpose, which was not to abolish the law or the prophets, 
but to fulfill them. He did not come in order to just completely remove the law of Moses and to institute his own law, but in order for that the law of Moses would reach its fulfillment so that it would uh, reach its intended purpose and thereby he would then establish his law. Uh, verse 18, he indicates that he is going to uh, pursue this goal um, to its nth degree. And then he also reminds them in verse 19 and 20, the, the ramifications of even though this being a temporary law, that law of Moses, which Jesus lived under and his disciples at this time were living under, though this being a temporary law, it has eternal consequences because it is a law from God. And there was no other law by which these specific people were bound. And so these people were warned about those who would relax the law. That relaxing the law was consequential to salvation. And verse 20 was an example of such with the Pharisees. How it is that their measure of righteousness did not mean salvation. In fact, it meant condemnation. And so in verses 21 through 48, we have the, you have heard it said, but I say to you section of the book of Matthew, where Jesus is going to specifically address six different topics, but I think in a more broad, general way, address four topics. And so that's what I want us to focus on today, specifically this morning, 21 through 37, as we look at Jesus' teaching on anger and lust and divorce and oaths. What I want us to see from that is when we look at anger and lust, what we're talking about there is feelings. And what Jesus is doing, he will mention what you have said, what he says, and then he'll place an emphasis on the heart. Now, the heart, we understand biblically, is the mind. And so what Jesus is addressing is how we think. So if anger and lust correlate to feelings, what Jesus is teaching in that section correlates to how we think about our feelings. And then when we look at divorce and oaths, what I want us to consider is what Jesus is telling us that we must think about commitments. Then we'll look at uh, this evening, hopefully, verses 38 through 48, looking at retaliation and then the section about loving your enemies. And that has to do with how to think about mistreatment. And then I think this whole section as a, as a, uh, as a whole is addressing the question of how to think about scripture. And we'll talk about that tonight as well. But this morning, looking uh, hopefully at verses 21 to 37, uh, we're going to begin here in verse 21. And going through verse 26, we pick up on this point on how we are to think about our feelings with Jesus' teaching on anger. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 21, it begins... You have heard it said, but I, uh, you have heard it, it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. And if you are offering your gift at the altar and there, remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you're going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard, and you'll be put in prison. Truly, I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. When I read this section, the first text that I think supplements this, that comes to my mind is Ephesians 4 and verse 26 where Paul is teaching us about the mind that we are to have as a Christian. Paul began in Ephesians 4 and verse 17 not to think as the Gentiles think in the darkness and the futility of their mind. Verse 19, this is not how you learn Christ Verse 26, he taught us about anger, Paul did. In Ephesians 4 and verse 26, Paul taught us two things about anger. 
He taught us, number one, be angry and do not sin. Do not let anger to overrule you. So there needs to be control. And then the second is, do not let the sun go down on your anger. Do not let anger persist. That's the guiding principles for anger. Anger in of itself is not a sinful act. In fact, if you're reading in a different translation I read from, there's probably some angry without cause. And so we understand that there's a difference, a distinction that is made in Scripture between angry with cause, angry without cause, righteous anger, unrighteous anger. And the implication here, obviously, is that we're talking about unrighteous feelings of anger that we have harbored toward another. And as, as we look at what Jesus is teaching about those type of feelings, what he is teaching us, beginning there in verse 22, is that emotions are a ground for judgment. Emotions are a ground for judgment. God looks into our hearts. In Proverbs 21 and verse number 2, it tells us that every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the heart. God is in tune with what is taking place inside, and he holds us accountable for the things which we do or the things which we feel. All of those things are important. The things which we think are important. You know, sins of the mind are just as costly as sins of the body. And that's why Solomon would tell us wisely to keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flows the streams or the springs of life. Proverbs 4, and verse 23. Solomon there is reminding us of the seriousness of of a controlled mind because an uncontrolled mind leads to uncontrolled behavior, which means by implication, a controlled mind leads to controlled behavior. Emotions are a ground for judgment. And anger, he would also show us in verse 22, is not an excuse for misspeaking. He brings up here calling someone a fool or insulting your brother. Anger is not an excuse for a slippery tongue. Anger is not an excuse for rash words. The words which we say to others, they have meaning. And if it has meaning, it has consequence. The words which we say might make us guilty. They might make us guilty of murder, even though we have not committed such an act with our hands or with our body. But because of the fact that we have shown through the demonstration of our lips that our heart is filled with hatred for our brother, we might as well be murdering. That might as well be what we go ahead and do. And uh, we'll see that uh, develop for us uh, here in a little bit. In verses 23 and 24, Jesus gives an example here of you and your brother at odds. He says there in verse uh, 23, we'll read this again. So if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you. You don't have something against them. They have something against you. Leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift allowing for anger towards you to persist in the heart of a brother is unacceptable as a Christian there has to be reconciliation before we can worship we cannot worship God correctly he's indicating Jesus is indicating God in the flesh is indicating we cannot worship him correctly if we know that our brother over there is at odds against us, that he has hatred in his heart toward us, that he is angry at something which I have done. That's one example. Another example, 25 to 26, Jesus talks about going to court. 
Now, the implication here is that you have done something wrong towards your brother because you're going to go to court, and Jesus is cautioning them, settle it out of court before you go to court and you have to pay every single penny. So, think about 25 and 26. When we are indebted to someone else, we have done wrong, we owe them. We must seek the path of reconciliation before it's taken to court. We don't stick our heels in the dirt and allow for them to drag us to court. And we seek reconciliation at the final, the final cost, as the final option, we seek it first. We seek it before they appeal to such. We look at Jesus' teaching here on anger. A Christian's concern must be the Lord's perception of their heart. Ungodly anger is held very high, as a very high charge. Ungodly anger. As high of a charge as murder. 1 John 3 and verse 15 would implicate such. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. You go back to Matthew 7, 23, depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Sounds like they have no eternal life abiding in them. What might be a reason for that? Anger. Unwarranted anger toward your brethren. As Christians, we are people of peace and reconciliation. We, we choose such before hatred and harbored feelings. That's why Paul would begin in Romans 12 and verse number 16, this whole section about true marks of Christian living. He would begin live in harmony with one another. And he would remind us of our duty of such in verse 18 of Romans chapter 12, saying, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Christians are peacemakers. How do I feel, how do I think about my feelings of anger? How do I think about my feelings of lust? Look there in verses 27 through 30. You have heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that uh, your whole body go into hell. Look at Jesus' teaching on lust here. And the emphasis is placed not on the hands But on the heart. That's where the emphasis belongs. Can we condemn the hands? Absolutely. But you can't condemn hands without condemning the heart. And you need to be aware of the heart. You need to be mindful of the heart. You know, as a disciple, there has to be things that we are discontent with. Sometimes we might get to the point, and this is a callous point, where we are content with thinking about sin. We're content with dwelling upon sin. We're content with meditating on sin. So long as we don't do it with our hands. As a disciple, we have to only become content, only become content with not even entertaining the thought of the sin. Temptation comes. You're not going to control whether or not temptation targets you. But you are going to control whether or not you sit and you meditate on that. You are going to control whether or not you entertain those thoughts. Or whether you reject them. There has to be rejection of such. Because we have to understand. We have got to understand. 
that if we meditate on these thoughts, it might not be today that I commit it. It might not be tomorrow. It might not be next week. But at some point, in some time, if I meditate on these things and allow them to dwell in me richly rather than the Word of God, the example of Christ, and so forth, I will commit such things. We need to understand what our feelings and our thoughts are trying to bring into our lives. What does anger want? Anger wants murder. What does lust want? Lust wants fornication. Lust wants adultery. Lust wants sexual immorality. Lust like anger, like a plethora of feelings, are destructive. And we need to understand where those things are heading. We need to have a concern for the mind. We need to understand that the mind is the center of the battle. We do not have the luxury of becoming lax in our thinking. Paul would tell us in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4 that the weapon of our war of, of our warfare are not the flesh. Ephesians 6 and verse 12, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. This is why I'm saying we don't have the luxury to be lax. So we're not fighting a physical battle. We're fighting a spiritual battle. Something with spiritual consequences, something with eternal consequences. And whether or not we win depends upon what is taking place up here, what is taking place in our mind, what is taking place in our hearts. The mind is where the true character of an individual is opened up and displayed before God. The things which we commit in our mind, right? Jesus isn't talking about acting upon it. He's not talking about fornicating with a woman or committing adultery with woman he's talking about thinking about that sin with that woman and he says here you've committed it you've done it in your heart God is aware God sees it God holds it accountable the things which take place in the mind imagine it are taking place right in front of God so how do we Think about that. What is our feelings towards that? What, what are our thoughts? Well, 29 through 30 tells us exactly how we're to feel, how we're to think about those tempting feelings. And that is that we must seek to remove the lingering thought. If the thought lingers, then the actions will soon ensue. You think David had lingering thoughts? As he was there in Jerusalem in his palace walking on the rooftop in 2 Samuel chapter 11. Was it just impulse that he brought Bathsheba in and committed adultery with her? Was it just impulse that he went ahead and he killed her husband Uriah, one of his mighty men? Or was it the result, the product of lingering thoughts, standing there and looking upon the bathing woman and thinking about what he could do, the type of power he would have over her. David's a good example of that. David's a good example that sin, sin is destructive. In its very nature and that sin it will keep us longer than we want to stay it will take us further than we want to go it will cost us more than we want to pay and so the thought then needs to be what Paul encourages the church in Thessalonica in 1 Thessalonians 5 42 abstain from every form of evil the word abstain a peco means to distance yourself, distance yourself, quarantine yourself from every form 
of evil. So we do not just simply refrain from the act of the sin, but we refrain from the thought of the sin. To be subject, or uh, rather to subject the flesh, to subject the flesh is to subject the mind, but also consequently to subject the mind is to subject the flesh. The two things go hand in hand. You're not going to stand before God with pure hands if you don't have a pure heart. You're not going to have pure heart unless you have pure hands. And so understand, we look 21 through 30. The point I believe that Jesus is making here is that a disciple cannot be content with ungodly feelings. He cannot be content with such resonating in his mind. In his heart. Rather, he needs to seek the quick and the efficient path of removal. We treat impure thoughts as if they are what they really are impurities. How do I treat an impurity in my body? I have cancer. Do I allow it to foster? Do I allow it to grow? Do I allow it to spread? Or am I seeking the quickest and most efficient path? Of eradicating it. You know which one. That's how we treat sinful thoughts. A disciple longs for a pure heart. Now let's look at 31 through 37 here. In 31 to 37, Jesus specifically addresses divorce, and then he specifically addresses our oaths or our vows. And here, I think what this displays is on the grand scale and on the more smaller scale, if we want to consider it such, our commitments that we engage in. In chapter 5, 31 to 32, Jesus is going to specifically deal with divorce here. He says in verse 31, It was also said, Whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, has committed, uh, makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. I think this goes hand in hand with oaths. Because marriage is a commitment. And if we think about it truly, marriage is the highest commitment. It is the highest vow that a man and a woman can make with one another. And the highest vow, the highest commitment demands the utmost loyalty and the utmost willingness to be true to one another. And so in matters of great commitment where such is demanded, a Christian is not to seek the path of withdrawal. What Jesus was referencing here is a true thing which has happened. In Deuteronomy 24, in verse, 20, uh, in verse number 1, Moses receives law from the Lord on how a divorce is to take place. And one of the things that's brought up there is the impurity of the woman. Something unsavory being found, something undesirable being found. Now from that has branched many different thoughts, but in the day in which Jesus is teaching, you had two main thoughts. One was a very, very, very liberal view, which was that in any case that I found displeasure in my wife, I could divorce her. I just needed to bring her the certificate. The other was not what the Lord was teaching, but it was the more conservative take, which was I could divorce my wife if something, uh, or I was to, not even that I could, but I was to divorce my wife if something sexually unsavory came about, something was made known. I married this woman thinking she's a virgin, she's not a virgin. There's speculation she might be out there committing uh, fornication with others, I'm not sure. I need to go give her this divorce. That's not how the Christian is looking at the situation. The Christian considers marriage to be a vow. 
And he considers, you think about our culture, we stand before at least one other person who did this year. We stand there before God, we stand there before our parents, our friends, and our family, and we're asked a question. Do you take this woman? And then you say, I do. And then the woman is told, do you take this man? And she says, I do. Now, whenever a Christian says those two words, I do, what they need to understand is that they are making a bond. Their word is their bond. They are making a promise. They are making a vow before God. And what they are saying in those two words is that they are going to pour every bit of effort and loyalty and willingness into upholding the marriage. But that was so different. That type of mindset is so different from even what we see with the Pharisees. But just look briefly with me in Matthew chapter 19. And just notice the difference in the mindset of the Pharisees. You can notice the difference because of what they're focusing on. And Jesus. Now Jesus, of course, is serving us as our example, obviously. We're Christians. We're to be like him. Notice this. From verses 3 through 9. Matthew 19. And Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? He answered, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore what God has joined together, let not man separate. Verses 3 through 6 there. The Pharisees are focusing on the cause for divorce. Jesus, conversely, is focusing upon the institution of marriage. That's two very different ways to look at a marriage. Continue in verse 7. They said to him, why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away? He said to them, because of the hardness of your heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. And so notice even the, the exception, right? How do, you, how do you view the exception? The Pharisees view the exception as a command, but yet Jesus sees it as a concession that the Lord made because of the hardness of men's hearts. They see it as command. He sees it as concession. Verse number nine. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for fornication and marries another commits adultery. You look at this final thing here. You know, what we get from this whole conversation is that the Pharisees regarded marriage very lightly. But Jesus regards marriage in such a high esteem, in such a serious way, that save for one reason, any and all marriage that takes place after a divorce is adultery. It's an unfit marriage situation. It has eternal condemning consequences. That's how Jesus views it. The Pharisees, they view it entirely differently. Many view marriage with such a low, low view. The Christian does not. The Christian, Hebrews 13, verse number 4, let marriage be held in honor among all. It's the highest vow we can make with one another. We need to esteem it as such. Continue. In uh, verses 33 through 37, Jesus is teaching on oaths. He says, again, you have heard it said, uh, you had heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, 
or by earth, for it is his, uh, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make your hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than that comes from evil. And so 33 through 37, Jesus is talking about our oaths. And he addresses uh, something that was being taught. Um, we understand this through more um, secondary sources than just strictly from the Bible. Uh, but what you can notice there, if you're looking at verse 33, you're not going to have a specific verse you can turn to in your Bible where you find these words. You can't find this quotation, but what you have here is kind of a summary uh, of different things that were being taught, uh, or, or, or a summary of the things which were taught in the law. And so based upon that summary, people had come and basically drawn a line in the sand where they said, on this side you have this one formula for your vows. And if you use this one formula where you swear by the Lord's name, you need to fulfill your vow. But then over here you have this other formula. And if this other formula, you're just swearing by any other old thing, anything but the Lord, you don't really have to uphold it. And so they would draw this line. They would say, based upon the formula, it tells you whether or not it's a big deal or not a big deal to break your word. Again, you think about what was being said, what they were saying, you think, okay, that's a pretty good summary of the law. But it is terrible application of the law. It doesn't look at the intention of the law. Now, the law would tell us in Leviticus 19 and verse number 12, you shall not swear falsely by my name, and so profane my name, or so profane the uh, name of your God, I am the Lord. Numbers 30 and verse 2, if a man vows a vow to the Lord or swears an oath to bind himself by a pledge, he shall not break his word, he shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. Deuteronomy 23 and verse 21, same flavor. Don't swear by the Lord's name. The intention of the commandments wasn't to give you a loophole. The intention of the commandments was to emphasize honesty in your commitments. Anything that you were swearing, the, the intention of the law was to say that you fulfill it. You be cautious with what you say you're going to do because I, the Lord, required it. When we think about oaths and vows, this is what we need to understand about such. When we make a promise, whenever we swear to one another, and we exchange shaking the hand for agreement or, or, or whatever it is, there, there's essentially a contract drawn and by us saying, I will do this, we are giving our bond. Now those things effectively, what Jesus wants us to understand, are promises to God. And so if I stand here and I say, I swear by the Lord that whenever my car reaches 200,000 miles, I will give it to Hannah. That is effectively me saying, Lord, I promise you that whenever my car reaches 200,000 miles, I'm going to give it to Hannah. She's not going to want it, but I'll give it to her. That's what's taking place when we make a vow. I make a promise to you, and I'm essentially saying, Lord, I'm going to do this for so-and-so. And now I am accountable to God, just like I'm accountable to you. And so Jesus' point on oaths in verse 37, it, if you're going to make an oath, complete it. Let your yes be yes, your no be no. Don't teeter totter between whether or not you feel like doing it. You don't feel like doing it, but you tell them you're going to do it. And so now you're looking for a way out. No. Psalm 15. 
Remember David's question, who shall dwell in your holy hill? Who shall sojourn in your tent? Who's going to live with you in heaven? Psalm 15 and verse 4. The one who keeps his word. The one who swears to his own hurt and does not change. That is who is going to dwell with him. A disciple's word is his bond. And that goes for all commitments. That goes for the big ones like marriage. That goes for the small, even undesirable ones. Like giving a high mileage car to someone else. Everything that we say we will do, the disciple must in his mind to do. Uh, determined to fulfill it rather than seeking loopholes that serve to their own benefits. That's what we see the hypocrites do. And that's what we see the disciples have been, have been taught by the Pharisees. That's not what Christianity is about. Christianity is about taking your commitments seriously. A Christian needs to be concerned with how they think. They need to be concerned with how they think about their feelings. You know, what do I think about anger? What are my thoughts about lust? What do you think about envy? What about covetousness? Think about Colossians 3 and verse number 5. Paul tells the church in Colossae, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. And he makes a list. Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness is idolatry. How do you put those things that are earthly in you to death? With the mind. We need to be mindful, concerned with how we think about the commitments that we make. Do we consider them binding? Do we search for ways to kind of withdraw ourselves from them? Or do we search for ways for us to fulfill it? All of this right here depends on how you value commitments in your own mind. How are you thinking? Look this morning at feelings and commitments. Tonight we will continue in verse 38 through the end of the chapter with asking how do we think about mistreatment and then scripture as well as we consider this whole section of 28 or 21 through 48. But for now, what we need to consider is how we think. We need to look inwardly. We need to inspect ourselves, as Paul would tell the church in Corinth in 2 Corinthians chapter 13. In verse number five, inspect yourself, look inwardly, and see whether or not in your mind you're aligning with Christ. You know, Philippians chapter two and verse five is a different context, I understand, but it resonates well. Let this mind, which is yours in Christ Jesus, be in you. Think about how Jesus is looking at feelings and how Jesus is looking at commitments and what Jesus committed himself to do he did and what Jesus felt he felt without sin and what his desire always to do was to be pleasing to his father and I hope and I pray that's the same for us as well for in Christ we have veered away uh, and, and have taken our focus from him and place it upon ourselves or others. Let's correct that. Let's change that. Let's be fully devoted and committed to our Lord. If you have a need for prayers or study in that regard, we'd love to help you. If you're outside of Christ, we would love to tell you of what Jesus did. Jesus came and he died upon the cross for your sins on its own, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21. And he did so out of an abundance of of love Hebrews chapter 2 or Hebrews chapter uh, 10 rather and uh, verses 12 through 14 also Hebrews 12 and verse number 2 and a number of other passages Jesus came and died out of love for you 
and he requires that if you're going to be his disciple, you have to believe in him, John 8, 24, that you are to repent of your sins. Your sins cause separation, Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. So repent of those, Luke 13 and verse number 30. You are to confess them before men, Matthew 10 and verse 32. Be baptized, Mark chapter 16, verse number 16. And be faithful, Matthew chapter 10 and verse 22. If there's a way which we could help you this morning, study, with prayer, put your Lord on baptism, we'd love to help you in whatever way we could. You can come make that known as together we stand as we sing. Someday you'll stand at the bar on high. Someday your record you'll see.